talk about being thrown in the deep end. I mean, but this is exciting. It's so great to see you guys getting going. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's cool that you've, you're here on our first day. Um, I think it, it's so important to us that the, the free speech aspect of what we're doing um, and, and rejecting a lot of the um, pressures and cancellations the rest of the media is, is indulging in, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so the work of the Free Speech Union, and I will I will disclose that I am on the board, so before people um, question why I'm so enthusiastic about <laughs> the union. <laughs> um, but it's great to have you here, and I want to talk to you about the AUT uh, cancellation. But right. first of all, before we even go there, that wasn't the only um, event that we had scheduled. So we had um, Carl Dufresne speaking at Victoria University, and we had Don Brash making a return to Massey after his infamous cancellation. How did those events go? Hey, look, uh, Don has definitely still got it, and uh, both of them were were fantastic events. You know, it's interesting the the hysteria, and really that's the only word I think we can use leading up to these events. Uh, at the Massey event in particular, the uh, university ended up flying uh, top security up from Christchurch, hired <laughs> security down from Tauranga. There was a strong police presence there, and they said, you, you you know, you can't just arrive on campus. We need to escort you on. And I thought, what have they have they received a threat or something? And by the time we got there, there wasn't a single protester, not a single person who uh, was concerned with us holding the event. Sure, they weren't, they weren't all people that agreed with us, mm. but you just think this is the hysteria that people indulge in, mm. that, uh, that the vast majority of Kiwis are really happy just for us to have our say. And that's, that's really the Kiwi way, just let everyone contribute their piece. It doesn't mean we agree with them, but we get to have that conversation, have the dialogue, tell them they're a bit stupid and move on if that's the case. you know. And, and yet at the moment now, uh, particularly in our universities, but in other institutions as well, we are seeing people saying, no, the conversation cannot happen. We need to shut it down. This is harmful speech. And, and just that very notion is actually quite dangerous in our society. Mm. The notion of um, of subjective harm. Mm. Um, you know, what one person's harm might be, another person might really not be bothered by. So does do we have laws that, that, that go to the nth degree? Do we not? This is the problem. And we saw then with the Auckland event that where there was no issue with, with Massey and Victoria University hosting their events, no um, cancellation attempts. It was very different at AUT. Well, that's right. And, and what's interesting, there's, there's two parallel uh, issues going on with AUT. There is, of course, the fact that we were hosting Daphne Whitmore. She had a perspective that she was going to share and an experience she was going to talk about it being uh, cancelled last year. And, and that was what we wanted to do. We wanted to hear her story. And so the fact that the university thought her story was dangerous, that, that she couldn't sp- share her mm. experience, that's an issue. But on the other hand, at the same time, the Free Speech Union has actually uh, incorporated with uh, the company's office in order to operate as a registered union to represent employees and, and, and uh, work for their rights to speech in, in, in institutions like universities. And the fact that they refuse to recognize those union rights is not only problematic as a cultural direction for our nation, it's illegal. It, mm. it, it's, it is that simple. And we have not been able to get a single reason from the university for why they they would cancel our contract with them to host that event. And and we know it's because uh, staff and students at the university were concerned about what Daphna would say, but the university won't admit that. And so they're playing this shell game of ever-changing reasons why we couldn't hold our event. And really, at the end of the day, it's quite insulting to the, to the public who wanted to hear Daphna's story. Absolutely. And um, have we got an idea of what the next steps are in terms of addressing the fact that they have broken the law um, by you know not allowing a union to to come into uh, a place where they have members and and speak to them. Absolutely. So we we have uh, legal actions in the work, uh, and and we will be uh, going hard against the university on this. We can't just let this slide. Our concern is that if we let AUT just get away with cancelling us and disregarding both uh, the the legal aspects of our union rights and the philosophical aspects of allowing people to discuss, uh, then. I don't think any university will want to have us come and discuss these complex issues. And really, we indulge further in this um, this culture that is growing where we just shut people down, exclude them, cancel them. And I, th- I don't think most Kiwis are interested in that. 
No, I, I would agree. Um, now, just uh, remind people that they can call in on 0800 debate, 0800 332283. If you'd like to contribute to this conversation, um, we can perhaps take a call uh, with Jonathan here. Um, so that's 0800 332283. Um, so Obviously, that event was cancelled um, and the other two went um, ahead without a hitch. Do you have anything else planned in the way of events or was that the... No, absolutely. Mm. So we are going to be doing a, a events at every university in the country. And, and mm. the reason we've identified that as a key priority for us is because uh, really, while most Kiwis in everyday life are not concerned about whether they can control the speech of other mm -hmm. people, um, th this opposition that is emerging in our country, in our culture against free speech, I think primarily comes from the university. It certainly extends beyond that. But that's where a lot of this is emerging. And, and you know, we saw that last year with the Matauranga Māori debate, this, this uh, instance where some very prominent scientists were cancelled uh, because of comments that they made around science in Matauranga Māori. So we will be holding uh, events at every university in the country. We've done Victoria, Massey and AUT. Well, uh, uh, we haven't done AUT, <laughs> but we, we will be back. Don't Attempted. worry. We, yes. Um, uh, so, so we will also be holding it you know, at, at all the other universities as well uh, over the course of the year. Um, but what was really interesting, if I can go back to the AUT issue, is this uh, survey that we did with Korea Research earlier in the year. And this was um, pretty important uh, research, we thought, given the fact that universities have a legal requirement to defend academic freedom. They, they are called to be the critic and conscience of the nation. And unless we have the right to free speech and the right to challenge assumptions and conventional ways of thinking, we, we can't actually actually be the, the critic and conscience of the nation. And so we conducted this uh, research to assess the way that staff at universities felt about their free speech. And uh, ironically or not, I don't think it's a coincidence, AUT ranked as the lowest in the country. Mm -hmm. And so I think we see that expressing itself in a material way now. They have a new vice chancellor there. And I really hope that we're not setting a new track for his tenure as the vice chancellor. We're going to be uh, really pressuring him to make sure that he stands up for his staff's right to free speech that he defends the the purpose of a university mm. which is to uh, expose people to different ways of thinking and and robust debates and that is how we move forward and develop knowledge and so i really hope that this isn't a new trajectory that he's taking aut on that will be really uh, dangerous for the students mm. and staff that go there has he been in the job long? Can we expect this to be a trajectory or has he kind of got the legacy of the of the the team beforehand um is he um has he got any track record on free speech Oh, that's a good question, Annie. I'm, I'm not sure. So th this is Damien Salisa that we're talking about here. He has just taken over the role from uh, Derek McCormack, who was in the role for, I think, 23 years or something wow. since since AUT was uh, founded. And so he's taking over from, you know, a legacy there. Um, you know, there are issues at AUT already. There's a culture, supposedly, of, of bullying and, and, and treatment of staff and that kind of thing. I think it all plays together into this mm. intolerant culture that uh, that tries to force our perspectives or our opinions or our expectations on other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I don't think you actually have a very vibrant work environment and certainly not a vibrant educational environment emerging from that kind of space. Absolutely. Now, um, just uh, another reminder that you can call in on 0800 3 if you want to join this conversation. Jonathan, when you um, went about doing this research with Courier um, Market Research, uh, what is it that you were setting out to achieve? Because I understand you've called it the inaugural piece of research, so you're intending to repeat it, to, to have like a data set, I guess. That's exactly right. So we've called this the first annual, and I always find that a, an amusing term. It doesn't admit, admit that this is the first time we've done it, but this is our first annual uh, survey on academic freedom in New Zealand, and what we want to do is establish a baseline of the way people relate to this. You know, we're working with Courier Research, they're arguably the, the, the best research market 
polling uh, organization in the country. And we wanted to have this really robust uh, methodology and, and, and set of data there that we can use to track over years to come. And, and we, don't, we don't have a horse in this race. We're not out to prove that universities are shutting people down. We just want to assess the situation. And so that's why we went to universities in New Zealand. We went to each of the vice chancellors and said, you have a statutory requirement to make sure this is the case. Work with us on this and it'll either show that you're doing a great job mm-hmm. and, and fantastic. You can then say, look, we are performing our roles as according to the law, or it'll show that there's some work to do. And if that is the case, you really need to be aware of that. You know, this isn't, this isn't to point fingers. It's just to say free speech is crucial. Let's see where we're at. And unfortunately, the vice chancellors wouldn't work with us. I think you have to question why that is. Mm. Uh, and, and then we had this research that came out that, you know, there were some really positive aspects. Most uh, staff at universities feel very comfortable criticizing the government. And I think that's fantastic. That's, that's crucial uh, mm. to have that kind of open discourse. A lot of them feel uh, able able to challenge uh, received wisdom. But 50% of them rated uh, the ability to speak on the treaty or colonization as less free than free. So it was a scale of uh, 1 to 10. And they, they felt more constrained than free to discuss these issues. And so that's really problematic. It was almost the same result for discussing things related to gender and sexuality. And again, it's not putting a a predetermined result in their hands saying this is the way you should think about it but the problem is they're not allowed to think about it they're not allowed to question the uh, emerging orthodoxy that prevails in these spaces Mm -hmm. and actually challenge assumptions and and if our if we can't do that at universities where on earth in our country will we be able to do that yeah, and we've seen that play out obviously because um like you said the masaranga um, maori um debate that wasn't a debate um non-debate, where, right. <laughs> non-debate um where those um academics wrote a letter to the listener um and were roundly criticized and um really cancelled in some situations and then now as well with the um the freedom to discuss gender and sex obviously we see Daphne um being um deplatformed so we can see that play out in reality um you're right just looking at the the research in front of me now um the mean score so um from one to ten of how how free people felt um for free to criticize the government was a 7.0 and that's pretty good Mm -hmm. i think um i mean obviously um you would always want it to be pretty high, but uh, yeah, it's pretty good that people feel like they can challenge um, the government. That's 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 really important. But there are definite issues um, further down with um, differing perspectives discussing some of those hot button topics. And, and, and you know, we look at that, and, and you're looking at the the mean there. So that's mm. the equivalent of the average. Uh, but but what was really interesting as you look at that data set, I don't want to. I'm not a statistician. And I don't want to bore your listeners by <laughs> by getting into the minutia. But what what you would expect on something like this is is for most people to be clumped in the middle somewhere where they broadly agree on the situation, and then you have kind of the extremes flow out of there, and that's what you call the bell curve. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas that's not what we saw on these two issues. We saw people that were ve- felt they were very free to discuss these issues, and people that felt they were very unfree and so that's then what produces a lower average but it actually shows that there are very different communities in these spaces and these uh, in these universities some that feel very enabled to discuss these issues and others that feel very constrained and we can't prove it through this data but our assumption here is that this relates to the way they view the issues at hand Mm -hmm. you know there's a particular vogue interpretation of the way we should think about the treaty or the way we should think about colonialism Mm -hmm. i'm not saying whether that's correct or incorrect but there is a a general assumption around the proper way to do that at the moment if i can use that word and so i think what this data is indicating is that if you agree with that vogue interpretation, mm. you probably feel very enabled to discuss it. And if you don't agree with it, which obviously a substantial portion of academics and staff at universities don't, you feel very constrained. And that's problematic. It's problematic if only a certain perspective has been allowed on our university campuses. Yeah, I'm just looking at, so like you're saying, the proportion of respondents who, who rated their freedom as a five or lower. Um, so... 45% of the respondents um, 
chose to rate um, their university as five or lower on the ability to question and test received wisdom. So that's the status quo. Mm, mm. Can I challenge the status quo? Well, 45% said no. Yeah. Um, so that that's pretty concerning. And then a dead 50% um, uh, said no in regards to the treaty. That's right. Um, so yeah. And, and then, if I can, would just mm. point out there, uh, a third of the respondents r- rank their ability to criticise the treaty or colonialism as zero to two point five. So that's very unfree. These are people who are saying no. I can't talk about this really at all. Mm. And so, um, you know, I, I think w- w- th- this research in many ways will admit raises more questions than provides answers. We're not putting this out there saying this is exactly what everyone needs to take on to to see how we go forward. It's saying there are some really important questions that we need to be able to discuss here Mm -hmm. and the issue at hand is that we can't discuss them. And so without that, we have no path forward through uh, you know, conversation and dialogue, which is actually the most peaceful means we have to mm-hmm. address our differences. You know, In our society, people will disagree. Uh, we'll disagree around really complex subjects like gender or sexuality. Mm. And you may say, it's not complex. Well, you, that's the complexity, right? There's some people that's think it is. That's the debate. <laughs> well, that's exactly. the, the, the differing opinions, and, right? And, and what, uh, you know, different countries, different cultures have had different forms of free expression but but what the western way of thinking around free expression since we've had from the enlightenment it's allowed us to move forward as as societies not all agreeing not all towing the same line we don't all have to think the same way but it means we can move forward peacefully using our words instead of uh, our weapons and and i hope that we're not losing sight of that I hope so too. Um, thank you so much for coming in and chatting with me. Do you want to just uh, let people know uh, where they can go uh, if they would like to join the Free Speech Union? You can see the work that we're doing at www.fsu.nz. You can find us on Facebook at Free Speech Union. And uh, we are regularly sending out newspapers and other material to our supporters to keep them up to date with our work. So make sure you keep an eye out for that.